my message this morning, the Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. Sounds like somebody needs some help. <laughs> Please go to Deuteronomy, the first chapter. Deuteronomy, first chapter. Let's start at verse 21. And I'm going to read right through to verse 35. Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of your fathers has said unto you. Fear not, neither be discouraged. You came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land and bring us word again by what way we must go up and into what cities we shall come. Now, that was an act of unbelief. God told them to go up, and they said, Well, just wait a minute. We've got to go check it out. And even though uh, Moses approved it, there's no evidence that God ever asked Moses for that permission. And the saying pleased me. That's Moses speaking. Pleased me well. I took 12 men of you, one of a tribe. They turned and went up into the mountain and came to the valley of Eskel and searched it out. They took of the fruit of the land in their hands, brought it down to us, brought us word again and said, it's a good land which the Lord our God has given us. Nevertheless, or notwithstanding, we would not go up. You would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us. He brought us out the land of Egypt to deliver us in the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. Moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakims there. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God which go before you, he shall fight for you, according to all that he did for you in Egypt, because before your eyes. And in the wilderness where thou hast seen how the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son, and all the way that you went, and you came to this place. Yet in this thing you did not believe the Lord your God, who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents in, in fire by night to show you by what way you should go in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swore, saying, Surely, there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which your father swore to give unto your fathers. Now, Father, this is the third or fourth message you put in my heart regarding unbelief. And I'm asking you, Lord, to speak so clearly. Awaken our hearts to the, of the horribleness of this sin of unbelief. And help us to see this mighty God who has promised to fight for us. And let us... Rise in faith this morning, believing God for the impossible. God, for those who need a miracle, for those facing a crisis, for those of God going through the hardest time of their life, let faith arise. Oh, God, we ask you to forgive our unbelief. Lord, you won't let me get away from this subject. You're dealing with me, deal with all of us, likewise in your marvelous love. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, the book of Deuteronomy is Moses rehearsing with the children of Israel in Kadesh Barnea about why God turned them back into the wilderness. <clears throat> now, the children of Israel, after 11 months, came to Kadesh Barnea, and they could look over the hills and they could see the Canaan land. They'd see the promised land. They were that close. And the Lord commanded them to go in. And, of course, they disobeyed, and this is what we just read. And so they were cast back into the wilderness, and they wandered for an additional 38 and a half years. And Moses now is speaking to the children. There, he, he's speaking to the children of, his, of the, the fathers who died in the wilderness. And he's reminding them of why their parents were wasted in the wilderness, how they lost the vision of people who were called and anointed, of people who God so loved, who, who so miraculously cared for and bore them up in his arms, and how time after time, unbelief and doubt and murmuring and complaining entered their hearts and how they grieved God. And God's patience came to an end with it. And he said, no. And he, he saw the committed unbelief. They were committed to unbelief. There was nothing God could do. There was no miracle he could perform that would change their minds. They were set in unbelief like concrete. 
And God said, that's enough. And he said, go back into the wilderness, not one of you. Not one of you is going to enter the promised land. And hundreds of thousands of men that came out of, out of Egypt died, wasted, empty lives in the wilderness. And he's trying to say to the children now, you're going to go in. But he said, I want you to remember what happened to your parents. I want you to remember what happened to your fathers. They're all dead. They're all gone. You don't have any of them now living to be 100. Uh, Moses lived to be 120. Aaron, 123. And, and Mary, much older than that. And they were not living. They're gone. Every one of their fathers, the elders, were all gone and dead except Joshua and Caleb. And he's also speaking not only to the children of that generation, but he's speaking to us today, upon whom the ends of the world have come. And the message is, beware lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Beware lest you, in the last days, fall. He calls it a fall into this unbelief, the same kind of unbelief that caused them to be driven back into the wilderness and live such empty, wasted, devastated lives. He said, take heed what manner of impossibilities you face. He said, be careful of the impossibilities that come against you. Beware that you understand that God will lead you. He led them into these crisis situations to enable them to trust him, to see his power and to to build. He wanted a people who would be unshakable in their faith, tested and tried, that a golden faith would come forth as a testimony to the whole world at that time and for history. And God uses some very strong language when referring to the, the unbelief in these children of Israel. Words like wrath. This is God's attitude toward their unbelief. God was wrath, wrath anger, abhorrence. He said, you've tempted me. You've tempted me with your unbelief. Moses reminded Israel, you saw how the Lord your God bare thee as a man that bare his son in all the way that you went. He went before you to search out a place for you to pitch your tents. He gave you a fire by night to show you the way. He gave you a cloud by day, yet you still not believe, did not believe the Lord your God. The Lord heard the voice of your words, and he was wroth, saying, I tell you, not one of these evil men or doubters shall see the good of the land except Caleb. He he said, God led us to Kadesh Barnea, and he said, there he tried us. He said, you saw the land, and God said, go in. They should have moved instantly on the word of God, the promise of God. God said, I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to go before you. I'm going to send hornets before you and chase them. I'm going to chase them like bees. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to chase them. And you're going to, many of these values are just going to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Go. Moses and the elders decided to send spies into the land. Now, folks, here's the lesson, and learn it well. You see, when we don't act immediately on God's word, if we don't stand and act on God's word and allow that to chase the doubts and fears from our life and move on that word, this word is given. God means what he said. He doesn't want to have to repeat it over and over again. He gives it and says, I expect you to believe it and stand on that word. They should have gone on. They would have marched into the promised land. They would have had victory after victory. And God would have, would have undertaken for every one of their crises. He would have seen them through. He was determined to, to bless them. He said, go. But you see, when you don't act on God's promises and when will you you toy with and say did God really speak did God really say that can I really trust my life to that promise so they send the spies and remember while they're there the enemy Satan himself possessed inhabited 10 of those men and he brought them back as liars as instruments of lies from the devil himself they came back the report they're giants The cities are walled up to heaven. Now, that's the biggest lie you ever heard. 
walled up to heaven. And, and, and now they, they have opened themselves to the lies of the enemy because they did not take God at his word. They didn't move when God said move. They didn't act on his promises. And now here they are, weeping about their children, weeping about uh, we're going to be in poverty. Our children are going to starve in this wilderness. God, you brought us here because you hate us. You hate us. How do you get from this point where they're ready to go, the armies are prepared, they have honed their skills, they're ready to go into the promised land. God's about to open everything he's ever promised to them after showing them so many miracles. And now, because they won't act on God's promise, they truly don't believe what God said. And now they've opened themselves to lies. And now they're weeping in their tents, they're murmuring, they're complaining, and they're looking up to the sky, shaking a fist. God, you hate me. You've left us to our own. They're doubting their call. They're doubting they're the anointed people. They doubt that they're special in the eyes of God. And somehow they say to one another, is God with us anymore? In other words, God, at what point did you forsake us? We, we, we've done our best. They hadn't done their best. They didn't believe God's word. They didn't stand on the word of God. And here they are now. The camp is in total confusion. When did the devil start lying to you? How many of these lies out of hell have come against you that you're not going to make it, that you're not good enough with God is mad at you for your past sins and really hasn't forgiven you. How is it that you can stand by and you, you know that God has called you to a life of peace and rest in the Holy Ghost? He's made you promises. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. He's made you promise that he's merciful, more willing to forgive than you are to confess. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. What happened? When did you start believing the lies? that God's going to fail you in your crisis. When did, did that come to you? Because somewhere along the line, you did not take God at his word. Somewhere you did not act. He said to them, fear not, neither be discouraged. But you see, they straggled, they, they staggered at God's promises. God had said, no enemy will be able to stand before you. But the Bible said they would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord. Now, Kadesh Barnea is a place God brings all his children. It's the, this is the place of ultimate testing of faith. The root word means fugitive, vagabond, or wanderer, because you see, if you make the wrong choice, you're going to be a fugitive. You're going to be running and wandering through a wilderness the rest of your life. And how you react, your Kadesh Barnea is a test, an ultimate test. You've come up to many tests. You can look back over your life. And you can see so many deliverances that God brought you through. Look back now and try to count the times that you thought that you were going down. And here you sit in this auditorium today. You look back with mercy and grace of God that has been poured upon you. And you can say, God has never failed me. It was hard at times. I thought I'd never make it. But God, somehow, some way, he made a way. There were times my finances looked so bad. There were times I thought I was, I was going to go bankrupt. There were times I thought our family would be broken up. I thought my children would never hear the voice of God. And, and looking back... Oh, I look back at all the hell that I experienced at times. Look back at so many times God in his mercy reached down and picked me up. And I stand here now in the grace of God. <laughs> and you are here by the grace of God. But there comes an ultimate testing time in our lives when we face to face with a battle so intense, so beyond anything we've known in history. And the Lord is trying to break us through to a place where we'll never doubt him again. He's trying to produce in us a kind of faith that is pure gold. 
For you see, without it, you can't please him. You can't please him just by doing works. You can't please him by Bible reading. You can't please him just by intense prayer. You can do all of that and still not please him because you've done it in unbelief. You can pray and still not believe that God answers them. But he says, without faith, you cannot please him. And the Lord brings them, Kadash, Bania, and they have to make a decision. They move on and live by faith. They have to absolutely put their hands in the hands of God because, yes, there are enemies. Yes, there are walls. Yes, there are giants. There are things ahead of them that look impossible. And yet God says, folks, I cannot understand why God subjected his miracle working power to human faith. I will never be able to understand that that God has limited his miracle working power in the hands of our faith. Because you see, it, Jesus said in his own country, his own place, he could do no miracles there because of their unbelief. He said, I can't work. Unbelief paralyzes God. And if you're facing a battle now, you're facing a crisis in your life. I don't care if it's financial, marital, on the job. I don't care if it's about your children. I don't care what it is. Whatever the issue is out of your heart or in life. If there's unbelief, God is paralyzed in working it out for you. Absolutely paralyzed. He said, I cannot do any work because of your unbelief. Is God still with us, they said. And what they're really saying, God, uh, if you're with us, we still wouldn't be in this crisis. This one's impossible. This is a hopeless situation that I'm in. Well, folks, if it's impossible, my Bible said he's the God of the impossible. He said nothing is impossible with him. You can't name me anything that is impossible with God. I don't care what you're up against. I have to stand on God's word. Nothing that you and I are going through is impossible for God to work out. And don't tell him how to do it. <laughs> Let me put my finger on the root cause of Israel's unbelief. It's the same root cause today. God's spoken word, his already revealed word, was not enough for them. They heard it and then immediately forgot it because it was not mixed with faith. And you see, the word that we receive from this pulpit or any pulpit where the true word of God has gone forth, if you don't immediately mix it with faith and have the Holy Ghost imprinted on your mind and say, I will not forget this. I'm going to make this a part of the fiber of my life. And, and God will speak. But you see, every word that God has spoken, they're in a crisis now at Kadash Barney, and they're about to go over, but they have forgot every promise God made. They have, they have removed from their mind all the miracles and all the remembrances of that which God had done in the past. And here they stand in their crisis, and they had not laid hold of a single promise. I'm asking you, when you hear preaching from this pulpit, do you lay hold of it? Do you let it take as a seed, take root in your heart? And say, oh God, water this with your spirit. Let it take roots so that when I am in a crisis, I have the word that I need. But you see, it was useless. It was not mixed with faith. See, they wanted a new word. They wanted a fresh revelation. God, are you with us or not? In other words, Lord, I really have to hear from you now. I have to have a word. And folks, the word that came through the lips of Moses, God said, tell him, I am the Lord your God and I will fight for you. But that was not a new revelation. It was not a new word. God says, I'm going to remind you, I already gave you everything you need to see you through. I told you, you the, it was in Exodus 14, 14, they were told long before, the Lord shall fight for you. You shall hold your peace. In Egypt, he told them, I will go before you. I will fight for you. I will dwell among you. 
Deuteronomy 3.22, you shall not fear for the Lord your God. He shall fight for you. Over and again, he said, I'm with you. I'll fight for you. I'll, I want you, though, to lay hold of this promise. But here they are, trembling before their enemies and saying, is God with us or not? Is that what you're saying now? Are you saying, Lord, I, I know that you said that you'd not let us bear any more. You'll not allow any difficulty in our lives more than we're able to bear. But, Lord, I've reached the point where I cannot bear. I've passed that point, and you're not there yet. I don't see any evidence of you undertaking for my crises. Lord, you said you wouldn't allow me to bear more than I'm able. But this is more than I'm able to bear. I've passed the crisis point. Right now, I'm in a place where I wonder if you hear my prayers. I wonder if you're with me. Are you among us or not? If you're among us, why aren't you working? If you're fighting for me, where is the evidence? And I'll tell you, it happened at Rephidim when they took God, led them right into the, to the driest portion of the whole wilderness, the driest spot, no water in sight in at Rephidim. That's where the children were crying, and God brought them to the point of agony, absolute agony. Yes, they were thirsty. They, they were at the point of total thirst. Children crying, and they're, they're, they're murmuring, and they're complaining, and everybody said, well, we're just human. No, but you see, God had, a, made, God had made them a promise. And God was waiting for them to stand on the word and say, well, back here, God met me. And remember, at this point, he met us. And over here, let's fall on our knees, raise our hands to God, and let's cry out to him. He'll answer. God will send water if it's rain from heaven. But now they tremble before their enemies. And God had told them the dread of you is going to fall upon all the nations wherever you trod. They're, you're going to be a feared people. And here they are instead trembling before their enemies. Do you, tread, do, do, do you dread and tremble before your enemy? Wouldn't that be besetting sin? God has made you so many promises that he will deliver you. I, I like what David said, I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil for thy rod, thy staff, and cover me. You see, the devil wants you to tremble before him. And this is what God despised, that he sees his people trembling before his enemy, his arch enemy. And God had made them every promise to sustain them, that no enemy could touch them. And folks, exactly what God has said to you, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. I'm more willing forgive than you are to confess. And if, if you cannot lay hold of those promises, you just tremble before the enemy. And the only way out is not by trying to promise God to do better. It's not gritting your teeth saying somehow. Yes, God does sanctify our will. The Holy Ghost comes and gives us the mind of Christ. He does empower us. But he wants more than anything else that you walk in the faith of his promise. The covenant of God, all the covenants work only through faith. No other way to bring the covenant into full fruition in our hearts. <clears throat> you want to go a little further? I believe that unbelief in the New Testament is a greater sin than unbelief in the Old Testament. <clears throat> it's a greater sin. And he did not many miracles there because of their unbelief, Matthew 13, 57. Now you think about that for a minute. This is the New Testament. And this is how dangerous it is. He said, because of unbelief, they, I could not, I would not, I could not do anything in their midst. The scripture says under the New Testament that, that his own disciples couldn't cast the demons out of a little child. And the Lord said, because of your unbelief. In fact, in the New Testament, Jesus was absolutely shocked at the unbelief of his own disciples. The Bible said he upbraided. In other words, in plain English, he disgraced 
them for their unbelief. In fact, the Jews, because of their unbelief, Scripture says in the New Testament, broken off of the vine. Folks, we have something that the Old Testament saints could only dream about. They could only dream about the communion that is possible that we, we now experience. You see, in the, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit occasionally moved upon them. You'll read, and the Spirit of God moved here. The Spirit of God moved here. But you see, the Holy Spirit had not been outpoured yet. And, and we live now in the time of the outpoured Holy Spirit. And you see, when they worshiped, they had to go to the temple. But you see, today God has made us the temple. This body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. They had to go to the temple. Now God comes here to his temple. The Holy Ghost abides. He has given us, he has given us his own son to bear our burdens, to carry us like a father does his child. He has endued us with the Holy Ghost. And we have all of these privileges and promises that the people could only look at about in the Old Testament, only dream about, and we live in this glory, and still we doubt him. They could only dream of what you and I enjoy now. You see, we have a Christ that's available any hour of the day or the night, 24 hours a day, a whole lifetime. You can call on the name of the Lord and you can hear his voice. My sheep know my voice and they hear when I call. We have this privilege and we walk stone deaf. In spite of it all in time of extreme testing, we doubt. Jesus said, shall God not avenge his own elect which cry day and night? To him, though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. I'm going to come back to that at the close of my message. And that has to do with the experience I had last night on 42nd Street. When I went back after 16 years where God called me to raise up this church. I went back last night. Have a time out, with, have some time with God, reminisce with God, and have Him speak a new word to my heart. And I'll tell you, it has to do with this when He returns. He says, Am I going to find any faith? Let me tell you the consequences of unbelief. <clears throat> all that generation, Deuteronomy 2 14 to 16, all that generation wasted away. The hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them. Now, folks, these are strong words. These are strong words. The hand of God was against them, his, his own people. His hand was against them. And he said, not one of you, not one of you are going to enter in to the promise that I made, to the rest. See, the promised land is a life of rest and peace and trust in God, a life without fear. You see, under grace in the New Testament, the Bible says there remains a rest and some must enter in. You know, when I read that this week, some must enter in. I said, oh God, if some are going to enter in, by grace, I'm going to be one of those that enter into that rest. Some have to. That's a command. God says some are going to enter into that rest. They're going to get the word and they're going to enter in. You see, unbelief defiles every area of our life. Now, we have faith in many areas of our life. We have faith that God is truly God. We believe that the Holy Spirit is on earth and he's, he's at work, that he's a comforter. We believe that we're saved by grace. We believe it's possibly sanctified by the Holy Ghost. We believe so many things. We believe there's a heaven. We believe there's a hell. We believe in so many areas. But I want to tell you, if, you have, if we have in one area of our life we're doubting him seriously in one area of our life. That spills over. It's like a cancer that defiles every issue that pours out of our heart. All the issues of life are out of our heart. And if there is one area in our life, you, you say, for example, your children are not serving God, and, and you believe for every other area, but in this one, you, you, your heart is sunk, and you've, you've almost given up on that. That area can defile every other source of faith 
in every issue in our lives. God's really been dealing with me that God says, what you want to faith, you're going to trust me that everything in your life, your finances, your job, your career, your marriage, your relationships, everything. If you're going to have rest, you're going to have to have it in every area of your life. You can't rest in one area and be agitated in another area. You can't be mad at somebody. You can't hold a grudge against somebody. Expect peace here, though you trust him in every other area of your life. You don't trust him for forgiveness and reconciliation. And he says to them, as for you, turn you and take your journey back into the wilderness. I'm not among you. And you see, the the sin of unbelief leads to the sin of presumption. Presumption is to act on your own as if you know everything is okay. In other words, it's just arrogance. It it says, I know. And so they they come to to Moses and they said, okay, we've sinned. They really didn't repent. If they'd repented, they would have received God's word to go back and learn their lesson in the wilderness. But they said, no, no, we've got this figured out now. And we should have gone, but we missed it. Uh, Now we're going to go. And so they, in their own skill, own power, their own abilities, they organize captains and they organize a small army and they head up the hill to uh, the Moabites. And Moses said, you can go, but you're not taking the ark. The ark stays right here in the camp. God's not going with you. You go, you're going alone. You see, we'll, we'll give God time. We'll, we'll say, well, Lord, it's past the deadline now. You, you didn't answer. So I'm going to have to do something about this. And so we take it in our own hands. It's presumption. It's arrogance. And say, well, well I, I have to get a hold of this or I'm going to go bankrupt. I have to, I have to do something. No, all you have to do is pray and believe that God hears you and open your heart and your ears for his direction. And say, trust, live or die, I'm the Lord's. If I go into the furnace, I go into the furnace. He can deliver me, but if not, I'm going to die in the furnace. I'm going into lion's den. God can shut their mouth, but if I'm meat for the lions, I'm going to be resurrected and I'm going to be with God in glory. We have to come to the place we don't even fear death. We don't even fear the spoiling of our goods. We say, God is in control of our lives. They go up, and the Bible said the Moabites chased them like bees. Chased them like bees. And you see Christians being chased like bees all over the world today because they're doing it their way. They're no longer trusting God. You see, God didn't meet them on their schedule. And they said, well, this is getting too, too, too serious. And I'm going to make something happen. Oh, man, have I gotten in trouble over the years for making things happen. God, where are you? I can't wait any longer. I love you, God, but I have to do something. Yeah, you're going to end up in the wilderness. Have you ever seen these people that that have a measure of religion? A lot of believers who even come to church and sing the songs and so forth. But you see, they have no faith in, in what happens then. They're, they, they go back into this wilderness, and all they do is murmur and complain all their life. I mean, they murmur about their kids, and all they talk about are their problems and troubles. And they're real problems and real troubles because there's no faith. And if you want to walk that way, folks, it's going to be, it's going to be your lifetime, the rest of your life. And what happens, then you lose your history. What, what happens to these uh children, when they go into the promised land, and the grandchildren of these who died in the wilderness, the parents' children say, what about granddad? What about grandma? Where are they? What happened? <clears throat> you see, the Bible says we, 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 we live as a tale that is told. And, and you see, there's a book being written here in the wilderness, and you know what the book's title would be? They all died in unbelief. And, and, and there's no history now. 
they, they die. And, and what, 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 what are you going to say? What are the, what are the children going to say? Well, well, for 38 years, all I heard was my granddad murmur and complain and think that God wasn't with him and, and, and he didn't accomplish anything. There's no testimony. There's, not, there, there's nothing I can show. There's no history. There's nothing. It's all gone. That's the dread of unbelief. Cut your history off immediately. And then all you have is that wasted life where the rest of your life you murmur, you complain, and you doubt. There is no joy. It's all gone. And you wait to die. I have a lot more there, but I, I, I want to just get it out of my heart. <clears throat> God's been dealing with me for a month on this issue because I'm, I'm finding if I go to preach to preachers and, and, and I can talk to them about brokenness and I can talk to pastors about sin and all of these things, but folks, if there's unbelief, nothing else works. This issue has to be dealt with first. Am I going to trust God with my life? I went down to 42nd Street last night. <clears throat> Gwen's down in Dallas visiting her grandchildren for a week and be home tomorrow, but I was alone, so I went down last night to 42nd Street. Between 7 and 8, that's when it's most crowded. The, the shows, all the show people are coming in, racing to their shows. I went to the spot where 16 years ago I stood weeping, where they were selling uh, crack cocaine, and they were advertising death. I got the good stuff that'll kill you. And I remember weeping there, and God said, raise up a church right here in Times Square. I went back to that spot. Ford Theater's there now, and there's steps. And so I went up the steps and just sat there, and I watched the multitude. Now, it's been estimated uh, probably on 42nd Street in, in a rush time, during showtime could be probably a quarter million people go past there. And I, I just sat there looking at these people running by. And I heard the Holy Spirit whisper, they have no God. There are no believers but a few. In fact, the few believers there saw me and came up and said, hi, Pastor, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, I'm praying. <laughs> and I was praying and weeping. And you see, they have no God except sports. They have the God of pleasure, success, and money. But they have no God. They have those false gods that are all, on all this mass going by. And I'm thinking, they, they say there could be a quarter million and, and they're not all here. Some of them are all, all the way up Broadway. So I'm, I'm probably seeing 150,000 people here in, in, in an hour going by with no God except in name only. No, so few submitted. Racing, and, and there's no joy. They, they look like they're going to the guillotine. I mean, they, they look like they're going to a prison. They're just racing. And I thought, no. There are at least 600,000 men that came out of Israel. And I said, I'd have to stay here half the night to see them pass by by the thousands. Here's maybe 150,000 passing by. And it was such a mass. You, could, you have to walk out on the road. The whole place is filled. In fact, I had to fight my way through to get to the Ford Theater from 42nd Street just to get to the theater. And I'm thinking, I had, I'd have to wait here for hours before 600,000 men would pass me, all going into the desert, all full of unbelief. It just struck me. And the Holy Spirit was teaching me. He said, you would have to see. And he, in the Bible says, only two. Now, can you imagine that multitude going by and only two men get into the promised land? Joshua and Caleb. And over 600,000 fighting men all died before the time. Died in despair because of what? 
unbelief. Unbelief. And I think of Jesus. I said, oh God, how do you reach them? Is there anything we have not done yet? Is there some way the Times Square Church, there's some way I've been here 16 years as part of the church and been here 40 years actually with Teen Challenge and uh, going back to the beginning of Teen Challenge and, and look at the masses. And Jesus said, you remember when I wept over Jerusalem and said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. They, they'd come from all over the world. The masses were in the streets. And he went out and he, he at a vantage point, just like I'm sitting there at a vantage point, and he's looking, he's weeping. He said, oh, if you'd only knew, I wanted to gather you as a mother hen under my wings as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. You would not. You see, these people that are marching by, they have the gospel on the Internet. They hear, hear it on television. They hear it on all these different places. They they. They have a testimony right here. They walk right by it here on Broadway. I see some people passing out tracts and nobody wants them. I saw the Jews down there, Hasidic Jews, passing out their literature. Nobody wanted it. And, and they're all going here. And, and I begin to see the value in God's eyes of a single believer. One who has faith. One man, one woman who has absolute faith in him. I, I was. I look across the street, and there, there's a great big billboard, and it's it's a new uh, music video uh, network that's being. It's called Fuse. If you have seen it, it's going. It's an evil uh, music video outlet. Here's a picture of Tammy Baker, all dressed up in drag, and it says, "I saw the light," and it was a TV with music videos. And under it says, Tammy is number one for Fuse. Tammy's number three for Drag Queens. And I'm like, it's, it's way, go down, you'll see it sitting up there, way on top of Broadway. And to see what unbelief does. To see how far below and sin a man can go when, or a woman when there's unbelief. When there's no trust in God. And I, I, I pictured sitting there, the, the Lord saying, it's near time. He's about to come. And so the searcher of all men's hearts starts searching for those that are trusting him. And he goes to the football stadiums all over this country. Football stadiums, hundreds of thousands every Sunday. And he can't find any faith. And then I see him going into Washington, D.C., into the Congress, and into all of the legislative bodies all over the United States. And he can't see any faith in all he sees or those trying to push him out of this society. Not even want to mention his name. They want to absolutely take God out. I see him searching in every college campus. And he can't find any faith. Here one and here another. And I see him searching football stadiums. I see him in hockey arenas. I see him at basketball courts and all the venues all over the United States. He's looking, he's searching. Where are those who are going to believe me? I, I, I came to die for you. I came and gave my life. Where is anybody that believes me, that trusts in me, give their life to me? And he can't find them. And I hear an angel say, go to your church. And so he goes to the modern church and he looks everywhere and they don't even believe in his birth as God. They believe, don't believe in a virgin birth. There is no faith. There's nothing but death. And he searches these cathedrals and he searches the city and he especially searches New York and he goes in search of men's hearts. Do you have faith? Do you have faith? Do you believe? He knows the hearts, but he's looking, searching. And then he comes to his own people. And remember the scripture said, he came to his own and his own accepted him not. He came to his own people and they didn't believe in him. And I began to feel the grief of God's heart because he comes into his church. He comes into his own body, to his own family, to his own children. 
and he sees despair, he sees fear, he sees so few that believe and trust everything in their life to him. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, I am not grieved by this. They've made their choice. They're children of the devil. But I am grieved because I have so few, so few to trust me. So him in the search of men's heart is here today. And I hear that ringing in my heart. And I'm, I'm sitting there and said, oh, God, surely up a few blocks on 50th Street and Broadway, right next to the most wicked show in Broadway, right here, and down here, Taboo, that's Boy George. It's all drag. It's all homosexual. And you see them lined up trying to get in there. You see families lined up and you see people lined up to see these shows. And, and you say, oh, that must grieve the heart of God. Not nearly as much as what he feels in his heart when he comes to his own house. He comes to his shepherds. He comes to me. He comes to all of us. And he says, do you trust me? When I come, am I going to have, am I going to find any faith? And faith will not take matters in its own hands. Faith will wait on God. Faith will stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Will you stand? Lord, forgive my unbelief. Forgive my unbelief, O oh God, how you hate this sin. Oh Jesus, you're merciful, you're so loving. But there comes a time you're going to have to turn us over to some wilderness experience. You still love us, you will still provide. But Lord, there will not be intimacy. There will not be that nearness of God. And we will murmur and we will complain. Oh God, forgive us. Lord, let this be a church that believes fully and completely in your faithfulness in a time of need even in the time of death. Oh, God. In these last days when men's hearts are going to be failing them for fear, and even now it's happening. Folks, can I tell you something? Look this way just a minute. I stood over the balcony, the street balcony of Ford Theater last night, and I said, oh, God. A number of years ago I stood here, and you showed me a vision of a thousand fires burning in the city. And you showed me 42nd Street all ablaze, horses, police horses and gunshots and young people running over the cars and upsetting cars and setting things on fire. And I said, oh God, have I been misled? Did I, is something in me that just, was that personal? Was that flesh? No, oh, Spirit of God came on me so strong. No, David. Every word, he said, I've been patient, long-suffering. I've, I've even tried to bring a government that would have some sense, semblance of righteousness because of my mercy. But the time is coming. And I believe I'm going to live to see, I don't want to live to see that day, but I believe I am. When all of this comes to pass, these things are going to happen. Folks, you're going to need to have faith. You're going to have to trust God. You trust God. He'll see us through. He will not fail us. God is faithful. Do you believe that? How is it that these, that the apostle ministered to, the apostle could say, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You were chased and you were harassed. But God has never failed. He will not fail you. He's going to keep his children in the hollow of his hand. You're not going to starve. 
your children are not going to be given over to the enemy. God's going to see you through. I'm, I know that I stopped this prayer for one reason, because I, I believe that there are a number hearing me now. And, and I, I base this partly on the response I got when I announced my subject. The Lord will fight for you. That many of you are facing that ultimate test. God brought you to this place. You're at Kadash Bania right now. And the Lord's brought you to this place. Everything that's happening in your life, God has had a hand in it. He's allowed it. He's going to see how you react now. How do you react? Will there be, from this moment on, after what you heard, still some murmuring and complaining and saying, God, why did you let it happen? Or why are you letting this happen? And, oh, God, what do I do now? Folks, you just rest in him. You come into his rest and die to self, die to your own will, and say, Lord, everything I give and I put it in your hands, live or die, I'm yours. Oh, God, answer the cry of your heart. Not, I'm not asking you to answer the cry of my heart. I'm asking you to answer the cry of your heart. Lord, there's grief in your heart when you see your children so downcast. When you hear, God said, I heard your words. You were in your tent or you were in your house. And I heard what you were saying. I hear how you talk to your husband, how you talk to your wife. You talk as though I've forsaken. You talk as though there's no God. You talk as though I'm beating you down when I'm simply trying to get you to love me and trust me. God, help us to see how much we are loved. You love your children. You're not mad at us. You're, you're trying to bring us to a place where we are able to withstand the storms and the trials that come our way because we have a history with you that you have answered prayer because we have believed you and we've trusted you. God, can we have parents that put their children in your hands now? Can we have people, Lord, in this house hearing me that can put their career, their job, their business, everything in your hands, their family, their marriage, and their own health, their own health, and not be afraid? Would you raise your hands, everyone in the annex, the overflow room, and in this room, raise your hands, and will you pray, God, forgive my unbelief? First, that's where we pray it out loud in your own words. Lord, forgive my unbelief. God, Forgive my unbelief. Folks, pray it. Pray it from your heart. Lord, I have doubted you. There's area in my life that I've not yet believed you in. And I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me and pluck it out. Pluck out the unbelief, oh God. I don't want a desert. I want to go into the promised land of rest. Lord, you brought us out to take us in. You brought us out of sin to take us into this rest. Some must enter in, Lord. Let us be that some. God. Oh, God, do it. In the annex. Right now, ask him. Ask him to forgive you and say, God, help me to trust you. Whatever it is, put it in God's hand right now. Put it in God's hand, Lord. I give it to you. I put it in your hands and I trust you, Jesus. Now, you can put your hands down. I'm going to give an invitation uh, for just one segment here. You may be visiting us for the first time here and in the annex. <laughs> but I'm giving an invitation. I'm not going to give an invitation for those who, who, who acknowledge unbelief. That everybody would come. <laughs> but there's some of you have walked in here now. You have to get to starting point. You're not even at the starting gate because you have slipped away from the Lord. Maybe you walked in here, you have never really known Christ as Lord and Savior in your life. And he's here, the Holy Spirit's here now to change your life. It would be a shame for you to walk out of here without the capacity to believe. And you can't have the capacity to believe without the Holy Spirit. And you have to open your heart to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is hovering over everyone hearing the sound of my voice. And he's here right now to bring a miracle into your life. If, if the Holy Spirit's been talking to you now, you may be bound, absolutely bound up. You say, Pastor Dave, I am absolutely bound by fear. 
I'm, I'm just about, it could be a sin. Nobody needs to know. Get out of your seat, up on the balcony, go to the stairs on the steps on either side. And here, man, just step out of your seat and stand here in the front. And we'll pray with you and believe for a miracle. The marvelous thing about living in the New Testament is that the Lord tore the veil. He's given us access and we can come at any time with our unbelief and lay it at his feet. We can come at any time. He'll never turn us back. You don't have to go into the wilderness. You don't have to go the way Israel went. We're the true Israel. We're, we're the Israel of the Spirit, Israel of the New Jerusalem. And we are his children. Or oh, how anxious he is. The moment he sees you take a move toward him. That move is not just walking down the aisle. It's a move you take in your heart. It's an attitude. Say, Lord Jesus, I have to have help. I'm asking the Holy Ghost to come and instill faith in my heart. I'm not capable of it on my, on my own. I have to have the Holy Spirit to come and provide the very faith of Jesus Christ himself. And he does just that. That's a wonderful prayer to pray, and it's music to his ears that you want to believe, that you want his heart. And you don't want to grieve him with the unbelief. And you don't want to tie his hands. God's so faithful. How many of you came forward and believe God truly loves you? He's not mad at you. Keep your hand raised, keep your hand raised and say it. Lord Jesus, I know you love me. You're not mad at me. You're not trying to chase me into wilderness. You're trying to bring me to your heart. Lord, I don't want to grieve you with unbelief. You said, I can please you through my faith. I trust you to forgive me and cleanse me of all my sins, of all my unbelief. I come to you as a child. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need you today. I need the Holy Spirit to comfort my heart and to lead me and guide me. I want to be a person of faith that you'll be pleased with, that you will smile when you see my heart because you know, like a child trusting a father, I trust you because you are my father. Now let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for your gracious love that's being poured out upon us right now. We thank you for this congregation, Lord. We've come this far by faith, but we've trusted you up to this day. Sometimes we faltered, sometimes we failed, but you saw something in our heart, Lord, that just held on tenaciously. And we say now, oh God, take us through this crisis. Take us through, Lord, all the saints that are here both men and women, young people as well, that, that are going through a great ultimate time of testing. Lord, let them rest in the fact that you're going to bring them through to victory. They're not going down. They're going to survive. But more than survive, they're going to be overcomers. Overcomers to give glory and honor to Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This recording is provided by Times Square Church in New York City. You're welcome to make additional copies for free distribution to friends. All other unauthorized duplication or electronic transmission is a violation of copyright and other applicable laws. This recording cannot be posted on any website. However, written permission to link to the Times Square Church homepage may be requested by emailing info at timesquarechurch.org. Other recordings are available by calling 1-800-488-0854 or by writing to Times Square Church Tape Ministry, 1657 Broadway, New York, New York, 10019. I want to talk to you this morning about the making of a worshiper. Are you a worshiper? Well, we'll see. We'll test it by the word of the Lord. Welcome to our visitors, all of you. May you have sensed the presence of the Lord here today. Exodus, the 14th chapter, beginning to read at verse 8. Exodus, 
14. Starting in verse 8, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. The Egyptians pursued after them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army overtook them in camping by the sea behind Pehoroth, before Beelzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore Afraid, and children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we would tell you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in this wilderness. Moses said unto the people, Fear you not, stand still. See the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you shall see them again no more. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. If you will, skip down to verse 19. And the angel of God went before the camp of Israel, removed and went before behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud of darkness to them, but it was gave, gave light by night to these, the Israelites, so that the one came not near the other all the night. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right and on the left. Heavenly Father, I ask you for an anointing, a special anointing for this hour and for this day. Lord, you put this message on my heart. I would prepared another, but yesterday you changed it. You changed it because you knew someone would be here that needed this. You planted each of us in the seat in which we're sitting. Lord, you brought us here. Whether we were here as a part of this church or whether we're here for the first time, Lord, you're going to speak. You're going to speak your heart and your mind. Spirit of living God, come upon me. Let me bring this forth as you planted it in my heart. Lord, we glorify you. This is not about men. This is about you, Jesus. We glorify you. All honor, all glory focused on you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in Times Square Church. Thank you for what you're doing in this city. We give you honor and glory. Now speak to us clearly. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now, you might ask, what in the world does Exodus 14 have to do with uh, the making of a worshiper? In fact, they'll tell you everything to do with it. Uh, in the passage we've just read, you find God's people coming into an incredible dark storm. A whole night of panic and despair. A dark night. Worshippers are not made in revival meetings. Worshippers are not made in good times. Worshippers are not made when the devil's fleeing from you. Worshippers are not made when you're in victory or in good health. Worshippers are made in dark, stormy nights. That's the essence of what I want to share with you from my heart today. And how we respond in that dark, stormy night. How we respond to the Lord has everything to do whether or not we're, we have the status or the calling or we have come into what God would call a true worshiper. It has to do everything with it. In Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verse 21, it says, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Now, here's an old man. He has been through one storm after another. He has seen everything in his family. He has gone through pain and sorrow and agony in his flesh and in his family with his children. And now he's in his last days. And the Bible says his last act, one of his last acts was to anoint the two sons of Joseph. And he worshipped leaning on his cane, on, on his staff. He's not raising his hands. There's not a sound. There's not a voice, and he's worshiping. 
He's worshiping because he's looking back over the faithfulness of God. He's, he, you see, he is steadfast now. He has proven to himself. He's proven beyond any shakeable, shake, he cannot be shaken. There's no doubt. God has always been faithful until my last breath. He will be faithful to me. God is faithful. That is a worshiper. That is a worshiper who has come to the conclusion, no matter what I go through, no matter what storms, God has proven himself faithful. That is the true worshiper. He worshiped leaning on his staff. As he leaned there, he was going over in his mind one victory after another, one test after another. And God brought me out of this one. He brought me out of that one. All these years, God has brought me out. Times I thought I would collapse. Times I thought I was, it was all over. God brought me through. God brought me through. Folks, I'm 72. I'm leaning on my staff now. And I'm living by faith. But I can tell you what... The greatest hours of worship are not when I'm in the church with you or anybody else raising my hands. It's not when I'm shouting with the choir. It's when I'm walking the street and I can just stop and say, God, you were there with me through all those operations with Gwen. You were there with me through all the lies of the enemy. You were there by my casket with Tiffany. And you brought us all through and you're going to bring us through to the end. And you have been so good and you'll not do anything that would hurt me or any of my family or the church of Jesus Christ. Leaning on that staff saying, God, you are faithful. God is faithful. You see, I want to talk to those who are going through a dark night. You may not be going through a dark night, but folks, all it takes is a telephone call. All it takes is just feeling a lump. All it takes is just one moment of time. Now, I'm not trying to scare you, but you know that's life. That's reality. Some of you know what I'm going through, what, what I'm talking about right now. But you see, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you about God's interest is not just in delivering you from a problem or a crisis, but in the process to make you a true worshiper. That you would come out of that Trial, you would come out of that dark night as a true worshiper. You see, God set up this whole episode that we just read about. The Lord told Moses, turn and encamp between Migdal and the sea, and ye shall encamp by the sea. It was God who put them there. In an impossible situation, there's the sea and the mountains behind them. And there's no other place to go. Now, they'd set up their tents. I don't know how long they'd been there, but they had encamped. They're in their tents. And they are rejoicing because, you see, they have tasted freedom for the first time. They'd been in bondage for over 400 years. And now they're free and they're tasting that freedom. They're not under the iron furnaces anymore. They are free from the bondage. They are a type of the Christian who's been set free from the bondage and the, the habituation to sin. And all the excitement. And they, they, they have nothing but hope in their hearts. Because they're now laying, laying hold of promises that Moses has given to them from the hand of God. And they've been told there's a whole new day ahead of you. There is, there's going to be a promised land waiting for you. And they're all excited about it. What a wonderful time it is when you, you've been saved and you're rejoicing and you're going on and the sun is shining and you have, you're living on the promises of God. And it's just a wonderful thing. And maybe some of you were there right now. That's wonderful. The sun is shining for you. The sun was shining that day. And they were anticipating, they, 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 were, they were saying at this time, somehow God will make a way. I don't know why we're here, but we're going to trust God. And then suddenly, there's bad news. Someone up in the mountain, a lookout, starts screaming, Egyptians are coming. You see, the Bible says God put it in the heart of Pharaoh, hardened his heart, that he would pursue after them. Don't think for a minute when you get right with God, you lay your sins down and you're under the blood of the cross. Don't think for one minute the devil's going to say, God bless you, goodbye. <laughs> you can be sure that 
He's got the hard heart and he's going to pursue after you. He's going to come after you. And suddenly the camp is in panic. Leaders and others are rushing up to the top of the mountain and they see the clouds of dust and they hear the rumbling of those chariots, 900 chariots and, and men on horseback and followed by an infantry and an army and, and all that it entails. And suddenly there's panic, that sudden moment of bad news, that report. The doctor says, uh, please see me in my office. Your lump looks suspicious. And then you hear those words, cancer. You see, I happen to know a few ladies in this church now that just got that news recently. It's that sudden report that comes. Now, you see, God loved these people. In fact, he called them his inheritance. Now, out of all the peoples of the face of the earth, all of his interests are on these people. He said, this is my heritage. This, this, this is my inheritance. Out of all the nations and all the people, this was God's eternal purpose in these people. And if he was ever going to have worshipers that had to come out of this chosen people, the worshipers would not come from the Philistines, from the Canaanites, or from, for, from those in the far islands of the sea. He had to get his worshipers out of this group. Now, God is in control of the whole scene, this whole episode, because God has a divine purpose. There's nothing happens to the life of a believer by accident. Never. No problem, no crisis comes to you on happenstance. Never. And at the point of their greatest peace, at the point of their greatest hour enjoying freedom and laying hold of the promises of God, the devil comes seeking to devour them. Because Pharaoh and his army represents the devil and his principalities and powers of darkness. And the scripture says the Egyptians pursued them. All the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and horsemen in his army and overtook them in camping by the sea. And Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. Bad news. Terrifying news. Sudden news. We had it here in New York City at 9-11. Within one hour, the most incredible disaster that ever struck the face of the earth. One of the most incredible disasters. In just a few moments, and within an hour, those towers fell. Notice the scripture says they lifted up their eyes and behold the Egyptians. You see, they were not looking now at the Lord. They were looking at the crisis. They lifted up their eyes and there are the Egyptians. And fear grips their hearts. I'm going to tell you, folks, when you get your eyes off Jesus, when you get your eyes off the Word of God, you're going to get your eyes on your problem. And it's going to overwhelm you. And you're going to say it's hopeless. This is impossible. I can't handle it. Of course you can't handle it. Nobody can without the help of the power of God. You see, it's still daylight. Or they would not have been able to see far into the distance as the Egyptian army approaches. They see this sudden disaster coming at them. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Now, this was not a... A, a cry of faith. It was not a prayer of faith. It was a, a cry of, oh, God, why? God, why, why didn't you let us die in the wilderness? It was better. And, and this is what happens when many come upon a sudden disaster in their family. Like, like the, the telephone calls that so many on our mailing list tell us they received. You know, there's been an accident. Your two children were in the back seat, and they're dead. And, and, and the panic, and why, God, do you allow these things to happen? Why would you allow? Because, you see, I was living on your promises, and, and I have given up sin, and I'm not living in sin. And I love you, and I've been praising you, I've been living right before you, God. There's no reason for this. And they lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians racing toward them. 
And it's, can you imagine what's going on in the tents? After all these years of, of bondage, after all the pain we've been through, why would God allow us to face more pain? When does this end? There's, there's nothing but pain. Does it pay to serve God? Why, why were we back there? At least we had something to eat. At least we had the variety. We had onions we could put in our soup. We had leeks. We, we had lettuce. We had tomatoes. We had all of these things. We had fruit. <coughs> you know, here we are in danger. God sent his people a simple three-point message, and he said, Fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Well, now, that's, that's, that's fine. Yeah. Hey, somebody comes to you, and you're in the worst time in the panic of your life. Just be still. God's with you. Everything's going to be under control. Oh, yes. That's the word of God. But you see, we can't lay hold of that. Not at this time. There's more that God has to accomplish in our lives. Places he wants to take us. The Lord shall fight for you. You shall hold your peace. In other words, be quiet. Now listen to me, please. I don't know who is going to face what, and God is not trying to put any fear on this congregation or any who hear this tape. But I know God change this message and all day yesterday just poured this into my heart it's not what I plan to speak because I, I really believe there are some hear me now that are going through their dark night just as these Egyptians did in the Bible Paul the Apostle said these things are written for our sake for our learning upon whom the ends of the world have come these, these things are not just stories told in the Bible this is God speaking truth to help us through our storms and some of you are facing a storm of your life, or you will be facing a storm. It'll come sometime. And it's not just one storm, folks. God allows these storms, but he has a divine purpose in it. God's one goal is that he would have worshipers. Not just fellowship, but true worship. Where, he, where will he get them? Where will he find them? It's night now, and darkness has come down over the camp. It's the beginning of a dark, stormy night. And, and in that moment, that cloud that led them through the wilderness, the cloud by day and the pillar fire by night, that cloud moved right over the heads. Now, folks, you've got to keep this in mind. They saw this. That cloud just moved and stood between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And it became darkness, blackness to the Egyptians. And on this side, it became light. They had light all that night that was available to them. It's a marvelous thing that God was doing here. And it was a cloud of darkness to the Egyptians, the Bible said. But it gave light to Israel so that the one came not near to the other all night. My Bible says the angel of the Lord encamps around about them that fear him and delivers them. The angel of the Lord, an angel of the Lord was sent. And that angel stood between the devil and God's people. Between Pharaoh and Israel, there was a fighting mighty warrior angel. We gave light to those so that they came not near all the night long. And if you read further, you'll you find that the Lord placed an angel between these, these two parties. See, if you're blood-bought, and you're under the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're walking in faith now, if you do what God says, don't fear, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. Because you see, no matter what happened that night, the angel was on guard. No matter what happened, God had made a promise. God had told them they are coming through this. 
And Moses understood it. Caleb, I'm sure, understood it. And, and Joshua understood it. There were people who proved God's point. You see, Pharaoh and his army are in total darkness. They can't move. They can't attack. They still have a voice. They can penetrate that darkness with lies and accusations. And it started when that darkness came and the enemy was stopped. I'm sure they didn't see the angel, but he was there. They could not make a move. Now, why did God do what for the Israelites what he did for Elijah and Elisha when they came up to the Jordan? Why didn't God just allow him to take his mantle, strike it, and suddenly there the sea opens and they go? God, it, God did that in the history of Israel to come. Why couldn't? He just take his rod like he didn't strike the rock. Why couldn't he just strike the water, the Red Sea, and it part? Why a storm all night, an east wind? Now, folks, in the original Hebrew, it says a violent ex, ex, exhaling, a violent wind. Now, God exhaled is what it means. In the middle of the night, all night long, oh, Huge windstorm. Now, folks, I can, I, I don't mind lightning. The more thunder, the more I like it. I'll stand out. I like, I want the house to shake. Because I love to see the majesty of God. Lightning, I stand at the window and tell my wife, isn't that beautiful? Bonnie's hiding in the closet. I'm saying, isn't this wonderful? But don't give me a windstorm. I lived in California, and when those Santa Ana winds came 70 miles an hour and the roof was shaking and everything, that was worse to me than the earthquake that we went through in California. I didn't want the wind. The wind shook those tents all night long. Why didn't God... Why does God allow us to go so long? And why such threatening horrifying moments of darkness. Now, folks, <clears throat> you, you see, the problem is there's voices that are coming and they can hear it through the piercing wind. And those captains, those principalities and powers on, on the other side of the wall of darkness, they're screaming, wait till morning. You're dead. You your family, your children, it's all over. You're going down. We're coming after you. Have you ever heard those voices from the other side of the dark wall? Oh, come on. An amen. amen. You have all heard that voice. We've all, if you love Jesus, you've heard that voice. I'm coming after you're dead. I'm going to bring you down. You're going to die. You see, they could speak these threatening words to the children of Israel. Those voices came all night long. The tents are shaking. Folks, I know what it is to hear that voice in Budapest, Hungary, the last uh, conference just a week ago. <clears throat> Probably one of the most trying times of my ministry. Please pardon a personal illustration, but I don't know how else to describe what I'm trying to get through to you as a divine truth. And, and uh, in the weariness, <clears throat> on a Friday night, I just finished the message and gave the invitation. And while people were standing there, suddenly my heart was palpitating. And uh, uh, sweats and everything. And uh, in my mind, I remember a doctor telling me to watch out for some of these signs, and I had them all. So I had to call Gary up to take over the service, and I, would, I had to leave. And I dismissed myself to going down off the stage, and as clear as any voice I've heard, you're dead tonight. Your, your heart will stop beating before the day is over. 
say goodbye. Your ministry is finished. You've done a good job. Now it's all over. I, 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 I just went and sat in the back room and uh, <clears throat> didn't give much thought and went back to the hotel. But that lie said, tonight, your heart will stop beating. That You see, it was a voice from the dark side of the cloud. It was the enemy. It's the enemy trying to defeat God's divine purposes. You know, I went home, went to bed, and uh, in the middle of the night, couldn't sleep, and got up in a here came those dark voices again. And you see, the reason those voices were coming because we had just seen hundreds and hundreds of pastors repenting. All these countries of darkness. I, honestly, the whole country of Belarus was reached. I mean, they came from every denomination, even Catholic, uh, Catholics, Catholic charismatics and, and from all denominations. And God was weeping. They were, re- they were hugging one another. One, one Presbyterian bishop hugging a Pentecostal bishop saying, we've got to stop this foolishness and this, all the miracles that we'd seen in the middle of the night. And can't sleep. And here comes that voice. I'm bringing you down. I got Jimmy Swagger. And he started naming all the evangelists that I knew that had fallen. Every one of them. He, he said, you are going down. I'm, I'm going to get you. And I'm bringing you down. You are going to fall. You're not going to do any more of this. I'm going to see to it that you are finished. And that thing went on for hours. And I got up and I started walking around the room and I said, God, what is this all about? What's, just tell me what's happening. And the Lord said very clearly, David, you're under attack. You're under attack. That's, but he, and I didn't even, I hadn't even read this yet because I just got this yesterday. And the Lord said, I have placed between you and the devil a warring angel. And you are not, you are under attack, but you're in no danger. Folks, get that now. You're under attack, but in no danger. Are you hearing it in the spirit? The Lord said, you have angered the powers of darkness because of the anointing. Just be still now. Don't be afraid and just lay down now because I have placed a warring angel between you and the ever. He can scream all he wants. Don't pay attention to the voice. He can scream all he wants, but he can't touch you. He can't touch you. Folks, I know what those voices are like. I knew what it was like this past week. Please pardon another personal illustration. And I don't want Gwen to get embarrassed. She knows I never embarrass her publicly. But many of you know what she's been through. When we go to a doctor and we show her her history that long, 25-some operations, four or five for cancer, and they look at that, they don't even want to touch her. I mean, they don't want to, they, they're scared, they back off. And she's been having uh, a problem with uh, bladder infection. She only has one kidney. And we, we went to the doctor this week, and she's sitting on the doctor's bench, and I'm sitting beside her. And he comes in, he looks at her record, and uh, he said, you know, I don't know how to approach this. He said, I really need to send you to a specialist. In other words, well, he was the specialist. <laughs> and uh, Gwen is, I knew what she's thinking if if, if there's no hope here. And then he says that word, I don't want to damage your remaining kidney. And I saw her tear up and I knew what the devil was saying to her. You're going to die. Your kidney is going to get infected from your bladder and you're going to die from this. I'm going to tell you something, Gwen. The Lord showed me that he's put a warring angel between you and those lies. And my prayer for you, dear, is that you can live a long, blessed life. But I guarantee you, you're not going to die from your kidney. I can promise you that. Because God, 
God is not in the business of making the devil's lies come to pass. What lie has the devil been telling you? <laughs> well, another one, where do I start? Well, folks, we're safe. No matter what we go through, God has a plan. Why, why is God allowing this to these people? The tents are shaking. The wind is blowing. And if they'd only come outside their tents instead of sitting in there saying, Oh, God, why, why? And, and, and not another time. And all of these things that they're saying inside the tent, if they just get outside, come out of that place of, of murmuring and complaining, come out of that place of fear because the lights are on outside. And if they just come outside the tent, and look down at the sea. The wind is starting to open up a path. The mighty walls are rising. Those winds, they're going to start shouting and praising God for the wind. They won't be afraid of it anymore. You've got to stay in the Word. That's the light. You've got to come out of the place of just sitting in your room and wondering and questioning and say, God, I'm going to get into your Word. The light will show you what's happening, and you'll see that the very thing that scares you is God making a way. God is making a way. He's going to bring you out. The pastor called me this past week, and, and uh, he said, Brother Dave, you know I'm under a lot of stress lately. But he said, this past week, I, in the middle of the night, I got a pain in my chest that so shook me it, it put me right up out of the bed I had to I sat up but just shook my body and then down my arm and I said oh boy heart attack and he said I got up and all night voice came you're dying it's all over <clears throat> he said I couldn't wait till the next day to get to the doctor and he said I'll tell you what happened pastor you pulled a muscle You see the lies of the enemy, the lying to scare you, to frighten you. When Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. Now get those words, all that night. Now, folks, we're not talking about just a 12-hour period or 15-hour. We're talking about a storm. We're talking about storms that can last for weeks or months. I don't know how long your storm has lasted or how long you may face a coming storm. But you can be sure God has a divine purpose. God does not allow anything in the lives of his children without something in mind for his honor and glory and for our benefit. And so they wake up the next day and are commanded to walk through on dry ground. Walk, walk through. You say, that doesn't take any faith. My goodness, where was their faith the night before? Folks, I'll tell you what. You get out in the middle of the sea and you start looking up at those, those, that river, those, those waters piled, I don't know how many hundreds of feet high. It's like standing by the Niagara Falls. And there's that wall of fire. Can you imagine the pressure behind those walls? Can you imagine them thinking, what if they give up? I mean, what if they leak? Just one leak. Boom, it's all over. Lord, are these walls going to hold? Lord, you've answered my prayer. You brought me this far, but, oh, God, all these things still ahead of me. The wall, is it going to hold? And, folks, I'm telling you, I suggest to you that this moment in the middle of the sea, on dry ground, when they've already seen the blessing, when they've already seen promises fulfilled, and right in front of them is, is the safety of the other side, right in the middle of those walls, that's when God tests them. That's the greatest test of all. Will you become a worshiper? Will you look up at those walls and say, oh, God, I wasted fear in Egypt. I wasted fear that you would 
destroy me that night when the firstborn were all killed among the Egyptians. I feared you all night long when the Egyptians came. I've wasted my fear. But I've seen your hand, O oh God. And I know that you brought me this far. You're going to take me through. And it has to come to the point where this man or this woman in the Red Sea, this child of God, says, Lord, I know you're faithful. You would not purposely allow those walls to collapse on me. But I'm going to tell you, Lord, you've already proven yourself faithful. See, he knew what they faced in the wilderness. He knew that they're going to face the fear of death and deprivation. They were going to be deprived of things. They were going to be suffering ahead of them on that journey. And he said, I've got to have a people who believe that I will do them only good. I have to believe for a people that will not be afraid to die. Folks, all our life we live under the fear of death. Not the Apostle Paul. He said, live or die, I'm the Lord's. He said, I'd rather go to be with him. Abraham, the father of these people, said, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And if these people in the middle of their trial and the fears and anxieties and uncertainties would quit looking at the wall, <coughs> quit fearing the caving in <coughs> of another crisis, and say, oh God, I know you're able. But if not, no matter what happens to these walls around me, if I see a collapse of something in my life or my family, I know one thing, it's going to sweep me right into the presence of God. It's going to sweep me right into the presence of God. I saw that at the bedside of little Tiffany, 12-year-old granddaughter. I saw the beauty of Jesus, and I saw a little girl who says, Grandpa, I want to go home because I've seen the face of Jesus. And he told me personally that... That I'm going to, he, he wants me with the flowers and the animals and I want to be there. I don't want to be here anymore. And her heart was already there. There was no fear because she'd lost the fear of death yes. and deprivation. And folks, the days that are ahead, God must have a people that are at rest. That have entered the rest of God. Live or die, I'm the Lord's. If you lose your fear of death, the devil cannot touch you anymore. He cannot hurt you anymore. A dead man doesn't fear anything. You say, that's not a picture of, uh, of faith. You should be able to say, oh, God did keep those walls. God will never drop something on you purposely to damage or hurt you. Never. But you see, God wants people to come out on the other side as worshipers. Now, these people did not become worshipers. Not at all. Oh, they became shouters. They became dancers. Oh, they made a noise. They praised God. They extolled the Heavenly Father for His Majesty. Miriam got her tambourine and all the ladies got their tambourines. And they were dancing and having a great time. God is so good! But three days later, they're at Mara murmuring and complaining, Where is the water? Why has God brought us out here to kill us? They were not worshippers. They didn't learn their lesson. In the hard time, they didn't learn the lesson in the storm. My lesson came. Folks, you can go to some church and everybody tell you everything always is going to be roses and peaches and cream. No, they're going to be dark storms. That's why this is recorded. And my darkest storm came that time when our third cancer in the family, after Gwen and then Debbie and then finally Bonnie, <clears throat> and standing outside the hospital room with cobalt machine being taken in, told she'll be there three days beaten with cobalt. Nobody's allowed in the room except doctors with a lead suit. And Gwen's out pounding the wall saying, God, I gave cancer to my daughters and now this. And the doctors say 30% chance of survival. And I get in a car, and you've heard the story. I drive out in the country, way out, and for two hours scream at God. What's happened? God, I don't understand this at all. And you, you, you come to that dark night, and the wind is blowing. And the enemy is throwing accusations, all lies. 
But that moment when the Holy Spirit came and God spoke to my heart. Bonnie's got two fathers. You and me, which one loves her the most? Which one would care for her and do what is right? You, Lord. Which one will not hurt her and do only what's right? Who knows the future? I said, you do, Lord. And he said, you lay everything in my hand now. Hallelujah. Folks, that's the day I became a worshiper. Hallelujah. I came out of that experience, not a word, not a sound, but it, I entered the rest. I entered the rest of God, saying, God, you're faithful. Now, Gwen's alive, Debbie's alive, and Bonnie's alive. But no, no this, let me hear, hear, hear me out. There's something happened that day out along that country road. Something powerful happened in me. I learned that God is faithful. And I said, God, if you take Bonnie, you have a reason that I don't know. There's something down the road, so I give her into your hands. I gave everything, all I am and all I have, into the hands of the Lord. Now, see, when the lies of the devil come, I know that there's an angel, that, a warring angel that he puts between me and Satan, and he can't hurt. And, folks, when I had to stand in front of Tiffany's casket, there was a peace in my heart. Oh, I cried. I cried the other night. I woke up missing her so bad I cried. But, you know, there's a, something in my heart that says, God, you know. And I rest in that. You see, I'm not worshiping God just when my hands are up. I'm not worshiping God when the tambourines are blasting. That's possible. But I'm worshiping God when I can look at anything that comes into my life and say, God, you're faithful. The world sees it. God sees it. And the devil sees it. That I am not going to be shaken in my faith. Because God, my God is faithful. Will you stand? Hallelujah. There's a song, God is so good. God is so good. Do you know that? How many believe God is good? <clears throat> Before we close the service, I'm going to give an invitation to those in the annex, the overflow rooms, and also here in the main auditorium. <clears throat> For, for some of you, that dark storm is the, the enemy bringing back upon you a sin, a besetting sin that you thought was all finished. And you have fallen back into a, something that you're so ashamed of. And you're in a storm. You're in a battle. And the devil's lying to you, telling you that... You're filthy. You're never going to make it. That you're going to die and go to hell because you're not like anybody. You're not like Christians around you. You are, you are going to fail and you're going to fall. Those are lies. If your heart's toward the Lord, those are lies. If you're trusting Jesus, if you still love him with all your heart, you come to him and he will give you that peace give you that rest that you have lost. Others of you here this morning, you, you're just plain discouraged. You're down. <laughs> you say, Brother Wilson, I don't know what's happened. I don't know why this has come upon me, but I can't shake it. I can't come out of this, this terrible thing that's gripped me, this, this sense of total uselessness and discouragement and despair. I'm going to open this altar for those who I've been identifying in one way or another. And if you're here and you need prayer, you're going through a terrible storm. If you're here for the first time and you don't know Jesus, and anyone that's here that you don't know the Lord, you're not able to call Him because you haven't yet yielded your heart to Him, why don't you step out of your seat and come and follow these that are coming right now and, and just say, Jesus, here I am. I sur- I'm going through a dark night. I'm in my storm. Jesus, provide a way. Jesus, come now. 
by your Holy Spirit and change my life. All right, it has to be, it has to come to this. Oh, I hear sometimes that the economy may collapse. I hear this and that, and I, I fear sometimes something terrible, tragic happened to my family. Folks, those fears have to be taken to the cross. They have to be taken to Jesus and say, no, Lord, never die. You're going to see me through. You will never forsake me. God, you're faithful. You've been faithful in good times. You'll be faithful in hard times. Nothing, nothing that touches us can bring us to destruction. Because, you know what God told me when I went through my battle recently was, uh, David, there's no wrath on you. There's no wrath. That's a good word to hear. I'm not mad at you. There's no wrath on you. God's not mad at you. He just wants to deliver you from all your fear and all your bondage. Please know that God knows our hearts. He knows exactly what we're going through. You know, the first thing, when you open your heart to Him and believe that He speaks to you, you know what He's going to say to you? I know your heart. I know your heart. And if He sees just a hunger, if He, if he sees repentance, godly sorrow, that's, that's how quickly He moves, how quickly. Will you, will you believe in His forgiving power and the power of the Holy Spirit? And also, now we don't worship angels, but these, the Bible said that they're ministers of the Lord, sent to minister to those who belong to Him. And He sends them to minister to you hope, and you see that you're not alone. Yes, the Holy Spirit abides, but out there in the world, out there beyond you, not in this vessel, but outside of you, God has placed a warring angel. I'll tell you what, one angel killed 185,000 Medians in one night. One angel. Can you imagine? <clears throat> I, I heard somebody say, the, my angel is over 800 feet tall. Man, I, I don't need an 800 foot angel. I'll take anything he gives me. <laughs> I'm not looking for an 800 foot one. I'm, I'm just looking at the faithfulness of God's promise. God's promise that he's going to protect and keep you. Hallelujah. Father, I ask you now to put in our hearts a rest. You said there remains a rest to the children of God. Now, Lord, the children of Moses, the children of Israel did not enter that rest. They did not become worshipers. But, Lord, we can become worshipers here in total silence, in absolute silence. When we settled in our hearts, God is here. God loves me. Jesus can forgive me and will forgive me if I confess. And I serve a mighty God who will not allow anything in my life that would hurt me. God will allow nothing in my life to just bring me down. And he'll not allow the enemy to destroy me. God, I believe that with all my heart. I believe that everything that happens in our lives has a divine purpose. I believe that, Lord, you are working something in our hearts. And if we'll just yield to you. And just ask you for strength. You'll give the strength. You'll give the strength. But, Lord, give us faith. Let us see into the darkness. Let us see the light that pierces the darkness. And let us say thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Before we do anything, I want everybody to come forward. Just lift up your hands. And I'll tell you, no, what you're going through, you know God's been faithful to you up to this point. Will you say, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to me, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness. God, I thank you that you've not failed me. You've not let me down. You're with me. Tell God, I know you're with me. God, I know you're with me. You have not forsaken me. Now cleanse me, Jesus. Sanctify me. Give me a pure heart. But let me enter into that rest now that I will not fear. I will fear no evil. I will fear no evil, for thy rod and thy staff, they will comfort me. Glory to Jesus. Glory be to the name of now let, now let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our blessed Savior, Lord, I pray that you remove from our hearts all of those fears and anxieties. Oh, God, and close our ears to those lies of the enemy. Lord, they come to bombard us. But, Lord Jesus, help us to see and hear your word. Help us to trust in your faithfulness. 
if all we know, if all we understand that God is good to His children and God is faithful to His children, that's all we need to know to enter that rest, oh God. God, you've, you've said, I will fight for you. I will fight for you. This battle is not yours, it's mine. I will fight for you. I'm on your side. I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend. I'm your beloved. Oh, God, let us see that. And stand up against the lies of the devil. And, Lord, for those who have fallen into a sin, Lord, don't let them be brought down by lies that God has forsaken or that there's some kind of a, of a, of a sin-satiated satiated person who can't ever come to a place of victory. God, that's a lie. There's victory and there's peace. And there's rest. We get up again, Lord, and we come to the blood. We come to the cleansing. And, Lord, we know then that there's freedom. And there's no wrath upon us. We glorify your name now in Jesus' name. Give him thanks right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. This is the conclusion of the message.